Yes. So um, I've had the privilege of working now with Dr. Patterson um, um, a little more closely for the last, oh, about a year or so, and enjoyed that privilege. He uh, spent a number of years in Japan, and um, he still occasionally has had ministry there, uh, speaking in Japanese for a service or two of theirs, and uh, recent, more recent, even the last year. And, uh, and then he uh, works in the GFA Home Office. This is uh, my mission board. And uh, he uh, assists in a number of ways. He's involved heavily in recruiting, heavily in training, uh, and as well as directing or being a regional director, basically like, uh, kind of like uh, where you're uh, missionary care uh, for mis our missionaries, GFA missionaries that are in Africa in the Middle East and in Europe. And so that involves some travel as well. Um, he's also a, a gifted teacher of scripture and he is an avid student of missionary uh, biography or missionary history. And uh, which I really enjoy because I, I love missionary biographies and history. So this, in a way, is uh, one of his specialties, and I think you'll sense that as we get started. So it's uh, really a great privilege. I'm great, grateful he's taking the time uh, to be with us these uh, couple of, uh, of online Bible studies. Okay, are you wanting me to get started, Tim? Sure. Do you want him to go ahead and get started, Brother Uchai? Please go ahead. Uh, we are now 8 o'clock, 8.02. It's uh, time to start. Okay, Dr. Patterson, okay. take it. All right. Thank you. It's it's a joy to talk to you. I've probably, I think I've met a few of you Yes. in some travels to, I've been to Singapore a few times, and also I think may have seen some of you in the Philippines at some of their conferences. So I really appreciate Dr. Barrett. It's been a joy to work with him and really uh share with you this morning uh, about William Carey. Uh, he is, well, I don't want to say too much before I get started with the PowerPoint, so let me bring that up and um, share that with you. All right, so uh, Carrie is famous, and I think you probably know about him. So what do we know about him? What do you think of when you uh, hear the name William Carey, and why would I choose him? I debated on who to talk about, but he is considered the father of modern missions, and I have that in uh, quotations because that's really hard to nail down, but I think it's pretty well established that most historians, church historians, would say this is indeed the case. So I'm going to um, share with you some, some slides of places where Kerry walked and talked. Uh, first of all, from his home country of England, and then we'll look at uh, some of the places there in India. But this is actually a plaque from the, what is called the Lower Circular Road Baptist Church in Calcutta. I don't know, I wish I could, I wish we could be in the same room and I could ask you questions and you could raise your hand. But I, I really wonder how many of you have been to, to India, but, at this church, to, even today, you could read this plaque. It says he's the father of modern missions. He's an upright, if you'll look down kind of in the middle there, humble, liberal man. He's a lover of nature and science, which is um, something maybe some folks don't know about Kerry, but he had a wonderful garden there in, in India. He's an eminent Oriental scholar and a devoted and sincere Christian faithful preacher of the gospel, and an extensive translator of the word of God. And then you have his motto. We'll talk more about that. Expect great things from God, attempt great things 
for God. So uh, as we think about him, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, be with these men. Thank you and the ladies and thank you for uh, what you've done uh, around the world using the gospel that you've given to us and commanded us to take and preach. Thank you for the example of William Carey. Stir our hearts this morning, we pray anew. Give us a desire uh, for the gospel, for our lost people, and we pray that you bless our time, guide the conversations and the opportunity I have now to present this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to go back to where Carrie was born. You know, someone's roots are important, and this tells us something about him that we need to know. It's, he was born in a little town, little village called Pollers Puri, and in that little town, there is this um, memorial to him. It says, to the glory of God and in memory of Dr. William Carey, missionary, orientalist, born at Paulus Puri, and he died in Sarampur. So I think you know some of those facts. So let's look at what uh, Paulus Puri looks like. Right beside it is another little village called Puri Inn. So as Carey would go with his family to church, and you all know that England has a long history of Christianity. Some of it was not pure Christianity, of course, but there was, there was a lot of pure Christianity. The church he went to was a church of England. Almost every village, at least every town in England, has, even today, a church of England a church, an Anglican church. And so this is just behind the church that he would attend. So he would walk through these fields on his way to church with his father. And his father was um, uh, an important man in the community. And we'll uh, say a little bit more about him in just a minute. But my brother-in-law and I and uh, sister-in-law and my wife went to England, and we spent three weeks visiting missionary sites. And as you probably know, there are lots and lots of well-known missionaries from England. So that's all we did. There's a lot of history in England, but we were looking for missionary sites. So we knew that William Carey had lived along this road that you see there in the front. It's called Carey Road even today. Back then, I don't think it was called Carey Road, but now it is. And we wanted to find the location where Carrie had grown up. So we couldn't find it. We saw this lady on the bench there. You see her, I think, on the right, just sitting there. And we said, we'll stop and ask this lady where William Carey, if she knows anything about where he was born and where he grew up. It's got to be somewhere along this road. Well, it turns out that her husband was nearby when we got out. It was this very house. <laughs> we had no idea where this place was. We just saw this lady sitting there, and it turns out this is the very place where William Carey had grown up. And so we had a really nice chat with these people, and you can see the, the monument there on the left, and I'll draw, get a little closer. It says William Carey. To give you the dates, 1761 is when he was born, and this plaque tells us that this little monument was made out of stones from his cottage, which apparently uh, his dad maybe got it from his father. I'm not sure, but it lasted a couple hundred years. So, you know, nowadays our places, our apartments or our houses don't typically last that long, but this one lasted a couple hundred years before it was demolished. So back then the houses often would look something like this with a thatched roof. Of course, most of us, probably most of you live in an apartment or a house with a tin roof or uh, maybe a uh, tile, but they had thatch that was cheap and they would just uh, staple or uh, bind it together and that served as the roof. So here's the, here's the church that Carrie attended and we were outside the church hoping to get inside just to look around, but there's a door and it's closed. So we found out that there's a lady in the uh, nearby who has a key. 
So I'm wondering if you could get this key in your pocket. How about that? <laughs> that was the key to get into that church. And she was the caretaker of that church. So she let us in. And um, so that was pretty neat. And so once you get in, this is what it looks like. And so my brother-in-law and I tried to reenact uh, William Carey as a child, which is hard to do. My brother-in-law is a big, big man. But anyway, his dad was the village clerk. So that meant that uh, for that village, he would record weddings. He would record funerals and other business related to the village. And it also meant that sometimes he would read uh, maybe the Psalms or things like that in the church itself. He wasn't the preacher, but he would sometimes speak in that church. So you see uh, there where the pulpit is. And looking down, you can maybe you can imagine little William Carey sitting in those benches as he's growing up. So did he hear the gospel as he was growing up in this Anglican church? Well, he would have heard the scriptures, so he would have heard the gospel. But at that time, probably this was not what we would call a, a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. But that's where William Carey grew up. Now, uh, I mentioned his dad just outside the church is the gravesite of his dad. His name was Edmund Carey. I don't know if you can read that grave marker. But that's his, that's his background. So his dad was also a weaver. Both his grandfather and his father were the parish clerks. But here's something that I think is important, and maybe you can remember this uh, with your children and with your grandchildren, if you have those. Carey was intrigued by stories from his uncle. His uncle had traveled to Canada and lived there for a time in the army. And he came back and he told lots of stories about this other part of the world. And that intrigued Carey, and I, I think in some ways kind of stirred his heart for the rest of the world, although at this time he's not a, a believer, he's not a Christian. Well, you had to learn some kind of trade, and so he learned to repair shoes. He's sometimes called uh, a shoemaker or a cobbler. Basically, he was a cobbler who uh, did not so much make shoes as he repaired shoes. So very um, typical job, nothing, you know, out of the ordinary, nothing really to, to brag about, but it was a means of making a, barely making a living. So at the age of 19, he married a lady named Dorothy. Five years older than he was, illiterate back in those days many of the women especially were not able to read and you think of William Carey as a brilliant man and he was but sometimes those people uh, especially the ladies did not have the opportunity to learn much uh, in the realm of education but she was this is key she was from a godly family we're going to see some Towns, I'll give you a little bit of geography here in just a minute. It's not so important, except that he grew up in an area where there were several dissenters. Well, what is a dissenter? Well, it's someone who is not going along with the norm, you might say. And these dissenters, most of them were Baptists. They did not feel that the Church of England, the Anglican churches, were true to the gospel. And so they uh, did not participate with those churches. And they had their own little gatherings back then. Um, there had been a time when the centers were imprisoned. If you remember, 100 years before Carey's time, men like Matthew Henry, his dad was a dissenter, and he had been put out of his church in 1662. And so dissenters had a hard life, and there were not so many of them. But this lady was a believer, and her family was a godly family. So 
William Carey begins to have, maybe not intentionally, but he is put in contact through his work with Bible believers, some other dissenters. So he worked as an apprentice, learning how to make shoes, how to repair them. And while he was working under a man named John War, he heard the gospel. And uh, this is a picture of that, one of those old homes that uh, where he would have been working and making acquaintance. So I want you to uh, try to just get a few towns in mind here. I'm going to see if I can highlight this for you. Just kind of keep in mind, okay, London is down here, down south of where we're looking, not too far away. Here's Oxfordshire, so Oxford University's in that. Cambridge would be a little farther down here, over this way. And here's Bedfordshire. Uh, if you know about John Bunyan and the book he wrote called what? What's it called? Pilgrim's Progress. So Bunyan grew up over here in Bedfordshire. So all these are pretty close. So Carey was born here, Paulus Puri, and that church is in here. But there's Hackleton, that's where his wife was from, not very far away, several kilometers. Piddington, we'll talk about a little bit. Olney, we're going to talk about. And then we're going to uh, see that Carrie lives some for a while in Moulton. And then Kettering is a very important town. So we're going to be talking about these places here in, in London or in England. So some background on Carey, just to kind of summarize now to move forward. He was working with another apprentice who led him to Christ. And so these were Baptists. And so he needed to be immersed. And here in the River Neen, uh, he was baptized. So this is a picture, not necessarily all the way back to Carey's day, but that's the kind of a tranquil scene there where he would have been baptized by a guy named John Ryland. Actually, I should say John Ryland Sr. Talk, I'll talk more about him in a few minutes. But here is the church in Hackleton. Now, in Carey's day, they didn't have a big gathering place like that. But this church still exists, and they still have meetings. So Carey's acquaintance as he's growing as a Christian is with Baptist dissenters. So after he got saved, uh, he began to preach. He wasn't ordained right away, but he was allowed to be what they called a lay preacher. And he would go back and forth to some small gatherings, small churches, while working as a cobbler. And you see the church today is there at the top, and at the bottom you have another idea of what some of the homes would have looked like back in his day. So he joined the Hackleton Church when it was officially formed, and he participated in a lay preacher's scheme, which is just uh, where they allowed people not fully ordained to preach to these little groups. And he did that for three and a half weeks. When he would go to these churches, it was a walk. He wouldn't ride. He didn't have, uh, I guess he could have gotten maybe a, a horse to ride, but he would walk six miles. So I, I think, I guess you use kilometers where you are. And so that would be about 10 kilometers uh, one way. So how would you like to walk 10 kilometers to preach and then walk 10 kilometers back? Well, give you plenty of time to pray and think, right? <laughs> So by the time you got there, you've probably gone through your message a few times. So in a lot of ways, it's probably a good thing, except when the weather's cold or rainy. I mean, you can imagine what a mess it would be. Keep your Bible uh, dry. Keep your notes dry if you have those. So interesting um, opportunity he had. And then uh, when he was 22... He was baptized, as I showed you there at the River Neen, and then he pastored. And I'll show you this church here in just a minute. Then he was finally ordained. Uh, 
at first, it's it might be a little bit hard to believe, but at first, Carrie was not uh, impressive. That maybe is the way to put it. So they weren't sure that he had a gift for preaching. I think his gifts lay more in the area of translation and um, and that sort of thing. But eventually, after uh, a year of testing to see if they really did want to ordain him, he was ordained. And then he pastored uh, in another place called Harvey Lane. And then in 1793, he went to the mission field. And we'll get to that here shortly. So here's a, a plaque at the Hackleton Church that says this place of worship was erected to the glory of God in memory of Dr. Carey, the father of modern missions to the heathen, and one of the founders and the first missionary of the Baptist Missionary Society. He toiled as a shoemaker, was converted to God, and preached his first sermon in this village. So Hackleton is a key place in his history just because that's his first sermon and so this church when I was there this was a few years ago still existed and as you can see they had their Sunday service at 10 45 in the morning uh, and only that one service so a lot of these churches nowadays are are not strong maybe like they would have been in his day so how did he get a burden for missions? What is your burden like? How can we deepen our own burden? Well, as I mentioned, it began from, of course, his personal study of the word. And that's important. We'll come back to more about that. But back in the day, there was a man named uh, Captain Cook, who was the most famous um, ship captain in British history, really. And he was sent on a mission by the government to map your part of the world, actually, a little farther south. They wanted him to find out what was, uh, what Australia looked like. And they, heard, they had heard there was another continent down there besides Australia. It turns out that wasn't the case. But he did, um, sail around Australia, New Zealand, even down to uh, the Arctic. And uh, he was able to map a lot of that, that area. And, and he wrote a book about that. And so Carrie would read that. And it just fascinated him that there was this other part of the world. And he began to read the Bible. He saw that uh, Matthew 28 talks about taking the gospel to the world. Well, why, was, why were people not doing that? That's the question that he began to, to ask. But in the process, in, in the meantime, he was studying Captain Cook's voyages and he would even make his own maps. And I'll show you one here in just a minute. And he would do research. Now, if you're doing research about let's say the religion of another country, what would you do? Well, most of us would Google it, right? Or something like that. And uh, we have some encyclopedias and things like that. So he didn't have obviously the internet to work with. So he would just do all the reading he could, but he did an amazing job of gathering information about countries all around the world, for instance, like Iran, you know, that's a Muslim country. How many people live there? What, what do we know about its religion? Uh, India, what's it like? What's Australia like? What's Singapore like? What's China? And so it began to make maps and to gather information. And he put these in charts and even had his own map. So, I mentioned that he pastored in a place called Moulton. Well, some of these churches where he worked no longer exist, but this one does. And it's, it was very encouraging to attend a service at Cary Baptist Church in Moulton 
Uh, here's the pastor on the left in that picture. The lady on the far right is uh, just a church member, and she leads or sort of as uh, a guide for church groups that come by there. They want to see this church, and there's my wife. And, and so that's what the church looks like today. And inside, they had this wonderful mural. We don't have time to go through it and, and uh, maybe get a little closer and look, look at some of the details. But they had this wonderful mural about Carrie's life in the church. And so you do see that, uh, that phrase of his that we'll talk about later, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. So there at Moulton, they have this little room where Carrie had his uh, shoe shop. And I'm in that room and I've, I'm holding one of his tools. I took my shoe off, but you can't really see what I'm holding. But they also put uh, some other uh, items in that little room, his pulpit. And I don't know if you can tell, but that pulpit would be something that would fit some of you guys, but it doesn't fit me very well. <laughs> A little short for me, but Carrie was quite short. And so that's his pulpit that he used back in the day. And uh, this is the room. You can see it's not very big. It, that's as wide as it gets. So that's where he would do his shoe repair. And he's got his bench is there right beside me. <clears throat> I'm holding a tool that you put into the shoe to hold it open so you can work on it. And uh, there's some other things in that little room. Uh, where that lady is, just to the left, that yellow door, uh, that's, that's it. So she showed us into that room, and we saw some of William Carey's tools that he had used himself. This is pretty neat, I think. This old sign from Carey's day still exists. I don't know if you can read it, but I'll tell you what it says. It says, second-hand shoes bought and sold. So Carrie was not so much a shoemaker as a shoe repairman, secondhand shoes. <laughs> so nothing glamorous about its background. That's that's the point. But that's, you know, God uses that kind of person, right? God uses the humble. He doesn't use proud people and he can use anyone in their training for his glory. So Carrie not super gifted in the area of working with his hands to repair shoes, but we'll find out he had gifts in other ways. So he was burdened for missions though. I mentioned this already. He was greatly burdened for missions. And so in those little towns I told you about in that map, place called Kettering, place called Olney, place called Pittington, in these little towns back in those days, there was a fellowship of fellow preachers, just like you guys. Um, this is important for us. This kind of fellowship is what we all need. So Carrie would go to their fellowship meetings and they would uh, preach to each other. And so Carrie kept talking to them and preaching to them. We've got to do something about the world and our obligation to take the gospel to the world. Well, his other, his friends uh, agreed theoretically that this was something they needed to do, but they weren't really quite ready to do it. And there was a bit of a, there was a doctrinal hindrance to this. So what do you suppose the doctrinal hindrance was? Well, let's read the title of this book little pamphlet really it's, it's I don't know maybe 60 pages I don't I forgot to look at it before I uh, came today but his fellow minister said why don't you just write a book for us a little pamphlet that puts together all this information and if you read the pamphlet it's got information about every country that Carrie could find out about and uh, how many people live there as far as he could tell what their main religions were, if there were any Christians there, and also his arguments for taking the gospel 
to the world. So this is the, the title that he gave to that pamphlet. An inquiry into the obligations of Christians to use means for the conversion of the heathens. So what are the means that he's talking about? Well, I'm going to hold off on answering that and let you think about that. It certainly wasn't the internet. It wasn't radio. It wasn't even books so much that he was talking about. I'll get to that in a minute. In one of the meetings, and this is 1792, he preached a sermon from Isaiah 54. I don't know if you have your Bible handy there, but uh, let me just read the first few verses of that chapter. It says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth in the singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Now, that is quoted in the New Testament in Galatians. So there is a connection. Carrie's points were actually well taken. And so God's point to Isaiah, and actually Carrie made the application to his day. Verse 2, enlarge the place of thy tent. And let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. And he goes on, great chapter. So he preached a sermon on that chapter about the need for us or for them to take the gospel to the heathen. And in that sermon, he made this statement. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Well, what do you think the response of his fellow workers, his fellow ministers was? Well, some of them were greatly stirred. In fact, most all of them were. Now, what do you think of the statement of the man who baptized him? We're not totally sure this was actually ever said. There's been some dispute about it, but it actually could easily have been said because of the doctrinal position these men had. He said to Carey, allegedly, young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. Now, what do you think of that statement? Well, here's the problem. Those men, some of them were, they were all Calvinists, but some of them were hyper-Calvinists. They believed what John Ryland allegedly said. It's like, okay, <clears throat> yes, the heathen are lost, but they're going to get saved because God is sovereign and he'll figure out a way for them to get saved and we don't have to do anything about it. The uh, text in Matthew 28 doesn't apply to us. That applied to the men in the apostles' days. Well, what do you think of that? Well, Matthew Henry addressed that 100 years earlier. He said, if you're going to claim that Matthew 28 applies only to the apostles, then you can't claim the, the wonderful promise that Jesus is with you always. If you're going to claim the promise, you've got to obey the command that's con connected with it. So uh, this is a mistake, and Kerry didn't believe this. Kerry, okay, before I say that, let me go back and remind you, Kerry talked about means. So what means was he referring to? Well, he was referring to, <clears throat> excuse me, he was referring to human means. Us, we've got to go. We've got to take the gospel. We've got to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's our obligation. And he was <clears throat> passionate about this. So 
Expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. You can't see it very well, but in that church in Moulton, they have this stained glass window and around in the blue part, uh, it has that statement. So here's a map just to show you who carries passion about this and carefulness. He would get information, he would draw maps, and he would, <clears throat> excuse me, he would stir and challenge his uh, friends about this. So who are some of these friends? There are books about Carrie's uh, friends that you would really enjoy reading, I think. I'm going to start with this one, John Sutcliffe in the town of Olney. And here is Sutcliffe Baptist Church. Uh, it uh, functions to this day. We were able to meet the pastor of this church. Olney is still a small uh, Brit uh, English uh, village, but it's famous. Uh, you may not know this, but you, you may. Here's the pastor on the left, and John Sutcliffe is buried just outside the church there in the back. But another pastor uh, during Carey's day was John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, and he was uh, he worked with William Cooper. That's C O W P E R is usually pronounced Cooper. Uh, Cooper lived in Olney, and John Newton and Cooper were good friends. Cooper wrote that famous song you probably sing it called "There Is a Fountain." filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Just a wonderful song. William Cooper had lots of mental uh, issues. He would get depressed at times. He actually wrote that wonderful song in a, while he was in an asylum. John Newton counseled him frequently. They lived just a few hundred yards apart. The church on the left is the uh, Church of England that uh, John Newton pastored at that time. So they would meet in their in the garden out behind Olney's house. There's that little garden shed where Newton and William Cooper would meet. And my brother-in-law is there with me at, uh, at that time. Uh, Cooper lived in that house right there. And in the Anglican church today, back in the corner, they have John Newton's pulpit. You can see it there. And if we get a little closer, uh, you can't, I had to, blow up that picture, but that says John Newton's pulpit. So Newton left only after a while, went into London and pastored at St. Mary Woolnock. But this is uh, Olney Parish, quite famous. Some of you may have read uh, Thomas Scott's Bible commentary. He was a pastor there back even before, well before Carey's day. There's a picture of Newton. Uh, there's a museum regarding William Cooper, who was a very good poet, and he and he and Newton wrote or gathered some of the first uh, hymn books. They made the first hymn book that uh, really we know much about, and we use some of those songs even today. Okay, so Sutcliffe was a friend. He was in Olney. There's a Baptist church just down the road from Newton's uh, Anglican church, and so Carey was calling for action. Back in 1791, they did nothing. Carey kept calling for action. They said, publish a pamphlet. He did. They still did not do anything. He preached his sermon on Isaiah 54 in 1792. They didn't do anything. Finally, in October of that year, Carey was very frustrated. They had gathered together. And they still decided, they really decided nothing. <laughs> he said, we've got to do something or we're not going to do anything. And so they finally agreed, Andrew Fuller, another one of his friends, a pastor friend, and he and some others said, okay, we will start. We, we don't know what we're doing. We don't have any money. We're just a little group of pastors here and, and you know, small place in England, but we'll start a mission society. And they started the Baptist Missionary Society. BMS is what that stands for. So I mentioned Andrew Fuller, very important man. If you read in theology, uh, you probably 
you might have run across some of the theological writings of Andrew Fuller, who was a pastor and a good friend, of probably in many ways Carrie's best friend. He pastored in Kettering. And this is the Fuller Baptist Church today, and it still functions. It's still Bible-believing, and it's a joy to go there. They have some historical things about Cary and the Baptist Missionary Society. Uh, you get a little picture of Andrew Fuller there in the stained glass window. So those men, when they would, when they would meet in Kettering, they met in this place. There was a widow who had inherited uh, when her husband died, and she had worked with him. They had a like a little hotel, and so these pastors would gather at what came to be called the Gospel Inn, and in one of the little rooms in the back side of this, those men decided to start the Baptist Missionary Society. So nowadays, if you go there, they have a plaque out front. They call this now the Cary Mission House. It's not a place that Cary ever lived, but the Baptist Missionary Society did a great work. Uh, this guy, William Nib went to Jamaica. And eventually, they, uh, this is the 50th year, kind of their memorial coin. And 100 years later, 1892, they celebrated what God had done with the Missionary Society. They went and had been to India and many other countries. You see uh, Taj Mahal down there on the left. So uh, God used William Carey to get this started. And now mission societies like Gospel Fellowship exists because these men had that kind of vision. Well, William Carey was determined to go to the mission field himself. Problem. His wife doesn't want to go. In fact, she at first refuses to go. So what is William Carey going to do? Well, here's some of his quote. Here's a quote to his sister. He says, I've never wavered about the duty itself, but I feel much leaving my family and people. Now, when he says family, this is very literal. The plan is, here it is. He and Dorothy, she said, I'm not going. What would you do if your wife said, I'm not going? <laughs> He said, okay, Dorothy, can we, can we agree to this? I will go to India. I'll take Felix, one of their children. He's eight years old at this time. He says, we'll be there for four years, and then I'll come back and get you. He's hoping that by that time, she'll be willing. So that's the plan. He's going to do that. Dorothy would live in Hackleton with her younger sister, Catherine. And so William Carey even gets on board a ship to do this, but uh, the ship's not able to go. And another man named John Thomas gets involved. Well, Thomas had been in India. He was a medical doctor and he, had a, he was a, a Christian and a, a good man in many ways. He'd been in Calcutta. He had done missionary work there. He heard about William Carey and, there, and these men and he uh, met up with them, and they said, well, we'll send him with uh, William Carey. So they'll be our first two missionaries. So John Thomas talks to Dorothy, eventually sort of talks her into going. And Dorothy does go, but she goes only because her sister Catherine will go with them. So Thomas and Carey and Catherine and Dorothy and their children head to India. So here's Calcutta back in the day. Uh, this is a picture or kind of a map of Calcutta. And of course, it wasn't nearly as big then as it is now. But just a few things. This is important. The River Hooghly uh, runs right through Calcutta. And Fort William was a college back then, a very small college. And they were training uh, basically British um, officials like judges and people like that because India was under British control and they needed someone who could teach oriental languages and eventually that's that was Carey's job he was a teacher at Fort William College and it paid well but that's not you know that's down the down the way a bit a few years so we'll come back to that so um, near William College 
uh, Fort William College was a place where Kerry stayed right here. And we'll see a little bit more about that in just a minute. So here's India, Calcutta way off to the east. I have Mumbai over here because I, I may have some pictures from there. I have a friend who's from Mumbai and we visited there in Surat. We have a friend who's a, a, a national, an, an Indian guy, has a little Bible, Bible Institute there and a church and some churches. And then just uh, on missions history, the Apostle Thomas seems pretty clear that he went to a place called Madras, which is now called Chennai. So that's down here. And so we're going to focus now our time on Calcutta and just a little bit north is a place called Sarampur. So Kerry landed uh, in India, went up to uh, Calcutta. And from there, he first went down into a very lion infested, malaria uh, infested area. And it just was very unhealthy. So they didn't stay there long with his family and John Thomas, by the way, was very poor with, with money. He was a great doctor, had a real passion for souls, but he spent all the money that was sent over there. And William Carey and his family were suffering. They weren't in Calcutta. And I don't think Thomas intentionally did this. He just didn't know how to live within his means. So Carey suffering, family suffering. They have uh, some death and their children, and so he goes up, finds a job, or he hears about an indigo plantation up at Madanabadi, up here. So he goes up there and, and directs a, a, an indigo plantation, and that is a little better, it's, it's healthier, and he is interacting constantly because he's immersed in the language, so it becomes quite fluent in uh, Bengali and um, Hindi. So he's there for a while, but then there, he's really looking for something else and a place where he has freedom. Unfortunately, the British government and the British uh, companies like the East India Company, they are not really interested in Christianity. And so they don't make it easy for him to operate. And so he's looking for a little more liberty and he finds out that Sarampur is willing to have him live there. And it's a Danish settlement and the Danish settlement, small, but is controlled by a Danish governor, a governor who's a Christian and they're very open to Christian work. So Harry moves eventually to Sarampur and that's where he spends the rest of his life. So we're going to look now at, uh, we'll get to Sarampur and see what that looks like even today. Here is a painting of some of Carrie's friends. At the painting tells you at the bottom, there probably was not a time when all of these men were actually together, but they knew uh, what they looked like. So this painter put them together. Here's Carrie off to the left. And then just to above him is one of the ceram. Oh, okay, it's done. Okay, I'll try. I'll try that. Yes. All right, are we still there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so this trio of Carrie, uh, Joshua Marshman, and William Ward. Um, serve together in great uh, unity and harmony and love, uh, really, until Carrie's passing. So Sarampur, very quickly here, is uh, this is what it looks like today. This is at the train station. That's my friend Ashish Majmundar. He's uh, Indian from uh, Mumbai. So we visited uh, Sarampur. And as we traveled to, uh, in that little town, as we travel to the location of Sarampur College, just to show you what India is like, here's some of the, actually three of the main gods. Of course, you know, in Hinduism, they have many, 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 many gods. But it's kind of sad to travel uh, just as we were in a rickshaw traveling to the little uh, college. We saw much of, much of idolatry. That's what the streets look like. You get a tricycle or a little rickshaw to take you there. 
So this is the uh, this is the location where Carrie lived. It still exists today. It's uh, actually a well-known college in India called Sarampur College. So it was started by Carrie and his coworkers, but mainly Carrie. And uh, so we got to visit there. And I'm going to uh, just point out that let me get my pointer back here. Remember the River Hooghly, very important because Kerry would get in a ship or a little a boat actually, and he would float down that river to Calcutta overnight. He would usually uh, get a, a small boat. He would sleep in that boat overnight, and then he would get there in the morning and teach at Fort William College. So now you can see uh, this, is, this is all Sarampur College, and this is the area we're going to be looking at. You got the river, you've got a main building. I won't talk about that anymore for now. But Calcutta is just down the river about eight miles. And so when Kerry was there, he would preach at, at uh, a church there called Law Bazaar Chapel. And this is uh, even today, that area in Calcutta is called Law Bazaar. You can see the police station there. So it's pretty neat because that's what that intersection looks like today. Of course, you know, Calcutta has probably 18, 15 to 20 million people. But this church uh, uh, is functioning today. We went to a service here. The man's a Bible believer. We had a, a good time. They had a service in, Indi in English and in Hindi. And so we spent the night in this building, very place where uh, Carrie would, used to preach. And it's called Carrie Baptist Church church and you can see it was founded uh, back in 1809 and so outside they have at one of the entrances they have that statement there's a lot of missions history connected with this church i think dr barry may have told you i would talk to you about adoniram judson who was america's first missionary and you know he went to myanmar burma but you may not know that uh, he came to this very church when he and Luther Rice and the Newells came to India. Uh, they had had a change of uh, conviction. Judson was sent out as a Congregationalist. He was uh, an infant. Uh, he was he, he was not a Baptist, but he became convinced of the Baptist position of immersion of believers. And so did Luther Rice, who was with him. Rice was not married. Of course, Judson was. So when they got to India, they got to this church. I'm going to show you the very location inside that church building. Right under my feet is where Luther Rice and Adoniram Judson and Ann Judson were baptized. And they were baptized by William Carey's co-worker, William Ward. And so there's a plaque on the wall back there. If you see where my head is. Uh, there's a plaque about Judson's baptism uh, in this church where we got to, uh, I got to preach in that church, actually. So that will be another lecture sometime about uh, Adoniram Judson. So the house there uh, we stayed in, connected with the church. I'm sorry. Now I'm going back to Sarampur. We're going back upriver. Carrie would come to Fort William College, he would teach, and then he would have to get uh, a carriage ride back to Sarampur. So this is the very house that Carrie lived in. Uh, here's the president today, or at least he was, of Sarampur College. He's very kind. He let us into the house, and that's the very, uh, those are the very rooms that Carrie, uh, William Carrie lived in, and this is where he died, in these rooms. I think it was back behind behind that uh, curtain back there in that room that you can see. So what's this? Well, this is a, they call it a sofa, and it's in the Regents, I think it's called Regents College. It's in, uh, it's part of Oxford University in England. And it has a lot of Baptist history. And they have this sofa. Well, here's what it's all about. This is what that little thing above my head says. On this 
I'm sorry, I can't quite see that because I'm seeing, there we go. On this couch, William Carey died. So I got to lie down on the very couch that William Carey died on. And uh, I just could not believe they had this thing out in public where people could just sit on it. There's actually a copier just to our right. And people can sit there and make copies. And it just, I just can't believe they have it so out in the open. Anyway, William Carey uh, passed away on that sofa. And we'll come back to his death in just a minute. So this is Sarampore College today. Within that building, there's a, a theology section. Sarampore College does have a theological uh, uh, degree. And then they have other aspects of a college as well. If you read about Carrie, you find out that they were so excited with the first convert named Krishna, Krishna Paul. In the picture, you can see off to the left, the river. I think you can see the water down there where, where the grass start, stops. And you see a cross, and that's where Krishna Paul uh, was baptized, right there along the river. And just to the right of that is Sarampore College. And just in front of us, what you see where the people are is a, Shin, is a Hindu shrine. So India still needs the gospel desperately. Well, when Krishna Paul was baptized, John Thomas, the doctor, basically, from that point on, he sort of lost his mind. He was so excited that he essentially became basically almost insane and he died not too long after that but uh just exciting that uh, god saved krishna paul and after that they began to see fruit and in carrie's lifetime they saw a lot of good fruit well how do you explain this man's success this is how he explained it i can plot he didn't claim to be exceptional he did say that he could plot and he did there was a time when they had a fire burned up all their their uh, little fonts that they had for printing, burned up some of their manuscripts, but he just kept plotting. So this is a few pictures from the museum there at Sarampore. He taught, he actually learned a lot about Indian culture. He got rid of sati, which was where the widow would be burned. When a man died, his widow would be burned. Uh, on top of the funeral pyre. Just a horrible, horrible practice. And you might think William Carey is a great man. I'm just going to put these men up here. But these other guys were very capable. They were uh, a gifted linguist. Marshman, the guy on the bottom, he translated into Chinese. He learned, of course, the, some of the Indian languages. He and his wife ran a school that brought in a good bit of income. William Ward was a printer, and he too wrote about uh, different aspects of culture. So these men were very gifted and they, they used their gifts for God's glory. Here's a picture of William Carey's Bible kept there in the museum or the archives in England in the Regents College. This is the live, this is the museum, and it's generally cons generally explained that Carey was able to work in about 40 different languages. A lot of these are very similar, but you can see all those, uh, a lot of those are put out for us to see here. This man is the curator of the museum. He's since passed away. Great burden on my heart. Talked to him. He had written about William Carey. He loved Carey. But when I asked him if he was a Christian, he said these words, I am not dissatisfied with my religion. He was a Hindu. He died a Hindu. He's passed away since this. As far as I know, he was not saved. Unbelievable. Just kind of an interesting thing here, and I'm almost done. He wrote a lot of letters back to England. He wrote to to uh, his friend uh, Fuller. If you know Hebrew, it says, of course, from, in Hebrew, you're reading from right to left. It says, from Kerry, that's the way he wrote it in Hebrew, to Fuller. Just kind of a play on words. But these men were uh, 
These men were gifted. There's his crutches. He fell and hurt himself in later life, and these are the crutches that he used. There's uh, an I a idea of the little boat that he would take down river when he would sleep overnight to go to teach. And uh, the bottom quote I'll read to you, the worth of souls, the pleasure of the work itself, and above all, the increase of the Redeemer's kingdom are with me motives sufficient and more than sufficient to determine me to die in the work that I have undertaken. Now, I don't tell you this uh, here in written form, but the, the reality is he said this when the work was not progressing. So encourage yourself. If your work is not going forward like you would see, just remember William Carey, I can plod. Eventually, God did bless the work. But Carey said, I'm going to do it anyway. The worth of souls, the pleasure of the work, increase of the Redeemer's kingdom, those are the motives that stir me. So as he's dying, you see there, he died on that, on that sofa. A man named Alexander Duff, who was also a missionary from England, came by and visited with Carey. And Carey said to him, Mr. Duff, you have been speaking about Dr. Carey. When I am gone, say nothing about Dr. Carey. Speak about Dr. Carey's Savior. So William Carey is buried there in Sarampur. This is his grave. You see Ashish up there looking at it. This is what it says. Very simple. A wretched, poor, and helpless worm on thy kind arms I fall. So William Carey, a wretched, poor, and helpless worm used by God in a great way so that today we can say probably very accurately, he is the father of modern missions. So it's our privilege to follow in his, in his wake, so to speak, and serve the Lord in our day. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate you men serving there in your in your uh, Jerusalem. May God prosper you, and we really appreciate you. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to consider William Carey. We pray that you would stir our hearts as his was for the salvation of the lost and the building up of your people through your word, through teaching, through preaching, and help us to be, do our part and taking the gospel to the heathen, as he put it, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Dr. Ke Dr. Barry or whoever, who's in charge? Thank you. <laughs> Brother Ujjayi, you want to? Yes. I want to finish for now? Okay, uh, Dr. Ellen. Uh, yeah, soon. Uh, we want to thank you for time. Uh, we appreciate uh, the sharing, and it's very comprehensive and informative to give us an understanding of the end and his uh, mission and the zeal and the, uh, uh, his aspect for the Lord. Uh, I just have to uh, wonder if you can just spend a few minutes to talk about the gospel foundation because seminaries maybe just to induce the uh, work to us so that we can actually pray and uh, support or even uh, know what is, what is the GFA doing? Okay, well, we have missionaries literally around the world. It's our, it's, we're not a large organization. Of course, you've got another GFA, you probably know about it, called Gospel for Asia, which is a very large, <laughs> very large group. But we have missionaries all over the world. I was just up in Canada this this week earlier, uh, my brother-in-law, whose picture you saw actually, uh, is a pastor and a missionary up in uh, Edmonton, Canada. But we have missionaries all, all over the Far East. We have missionaries in, in Korea. Uh, of course, we were in Japan. We have missionaries in the Philippines and Vietnam and Thailand and uh, Australia. We have people in New Zealand and Papua New Guinea. Um, so 
And then over my area that I'm responsible for right now is Europe and the Middle East and Africa. And so there are just so many needs. We have missionaries in Poland. And so you probably know about Ukraine and all the problems there. Well, these missionaries border Ukraine and uh, they're actually on deputation, but you might pray about the Ukrainian believers and the ministries around there in Poland and uh, of course, Germany and some other European countries, France with missionaries in Austria. We have missionaries in the UK, uh, in, in Edinburgh, and in London, London is a huge metropolitan city that's got all kinds of, uh, it's, uh, you almost have a harder time hearing English than you do uh, uh, like Urdu or something, a lot of Pakistanis, just a lot of opportunity in London, which is a very needy city. And then we have missionaries uh, down in uh, the Caribbean, Dominica and Costa Rica, Mexico. We have missionaries in Brazil. So really just pray for the word of God to run and to be glorified. That it would prosper wherever it's preached as it did in Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. Uh, Paul says, pray that it would happen just like it did with you guys. Uh, there in Thessalonica, so that the people turn from idols to serve the true and living God. So we have just a wonderful group of missionaries. Of course, the Philippines, I didn't mean to skip that, Dr. Barry. <laughs> a lot of missionaries in the Philippines, wonderful um, source there that can reach much of Asia, as you know. And they get students from other parts of uh, Asia. Yeah. So uh, it's just, it's just really doing what Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature. And I know you guys have uh, Indonesia. We would love to send some missionaries. We have a missionary couple quite interested in going to Indonesia to work with a guy named John Sung. Of course, you know that name from the past. Um, so I don't know, brother, if that answered your question, but... We do just ask prayer for wisdom and for God's word to, to really prosper wherever it's preached. Yes. Well, thank you for the introductions and uh, give us an understanding idea of what the uh, GFA is about. And uh, is there anybody who wants to ask any questions before we end the session? Uh, if not, we'll see you next week and uh, we ask Dr. Barry to close us in the prayer. Okay. Okay. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for using very ordinary people yes. like William Carey, like me. And we pray that you would help each of us to be faithful in what you've given us to do. Help us to value souls. Help us to speak the gospel at every opportunity and cause your word as it is preached to run and be glorified. Hmm. Give rest now to the believers there in Singapore and a blessed day tomorrow in whatever they are doing. And we commit ourselves now into your hands in Jesus' name, amen.